Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Titan Apps training session. I am Michelle Loker, one of the technology trainers on campus. Today we're going to talk about the email contacts, task chat, calendar, and drive. If you do have any questions regarding um, Titan Apps at all, you can contact the help desk at acshelp at uwosh.edu, or you can also call them at 424-3020. If you do need a password reset, you will need to call them and they'll have to do that over the phone. We do also have a Titan app site out there that you can take a look at. There are other materials out there um, as far as videos, um, different tutorials and guides, as well as um, if you're a mobile device user, you can go there and um, get directions on how to set up your mobile device. So we're going to talk about Titan apps today, and UW Oshkosh has partnered with Google to provide faculty, staff, and students on campus with a web-based email contacts, calendar, chat, and document collaboration suite known as Google Apps for Education, which we are calling Titan Apps. So today, as far as email contacts, task, and chat go, everybody, I'm sure, is logged in already. Um, so we can talk about the Titan Apps environment, how to use your message actions to take action on a message, how to customize the inbox to your liking, how to work with messages, compose new messages, how to use your labels to organize the messages. So in the old system, they used to be called folders. In the new system, they're called labels because they have more functionality. You can have a message that has multiple labels on it. And then we'll go through how to use the searching feature. The searching feature is really super easy to use. In this system, it's going to search your whole account in the old system you had to use to remember where a message was in order to be able to find it. So this is much easier to find a message. We'll talk about how to filter messages and then we'll work with contacts, tasks, and chat. Excuse me. That's okay. There's handouts right there at the front table. And then as far as the calendar goes, I'll talk about how to access your calendar, work within the calendar environment, create events, delete events, Share your calendar with others if you need to. How to view or add calendars to your calendar list. So if you have um, colleagues that you work with frequently and you need to access their calendar quickly, you can add that to your calendar list and access them quickly. Uh, we'll talk about how to view those calendars differently. So you can assign different colors to the different calendars and you can overlap them with each other so you can see who is available at what time. And then I'll show you how to create additional calendars if you need to. As far as the Titan app stocks or drive goes, we are going to do just a very basic quick introduction. Um, what it is is it allows you to use a web-based system to store your files as well as share with others um, either on campus or anybody that has a Gmail account. So I'm just going to quickly show you how to create or import, how to view the revision history, and then how to share with others. Um, if you did not pick up a manual, go ahead and do that. Um, at the front table here. All our training manu manuals are on the training website at uwosh.edu slash training. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we do recommend with the system that you either use Firefox or Chrome. So on your desktop, you should see a Firefox icon. You can go ahead and double click on that to open it up. And we want to go to the UW Oshkosh homepage. So if you look in your bar, that toolbar that goes across the top here, just click on UWO. Once you go there, you can select um, or hover over your Titan Services bar, drag down and select Titan Apps. So here is the Titan Apps website that I was referring to earlier. Everything is broke down by topic. So you have email, calendar, Drive and Docs, you have information on mobile devices here as well. To log in, you would go over to the right hand side and select login. Now for any reason, if this page was down, you can always go to gmail.com and still log into your email. So when you log in, you want to log in with your username that includes the at uwosh.edu. So 
So if you want, you can go ahead and turn to page two of the handout, and at the top it talks about how to add an account. So you logged into your account, but if you need to log into an additional account, if you have a separate account that you need to access, let's say you have a general office account that you also maintain, you can do that by using the add account feature, which is up in the top right hand corner here, underneath where your email account shows, if you click that drop down arrow, you can select add account. So then I could log in with my separate account. And now I'm able to maintain both of those in the same browser without getting log logged out of one of the um, my other account. So I can have two different accounts open at once. So that's how you can add an account. Moving on to page three, talking about the email interface. So across the top, you will have your application bar, this black bar that goes across the top. So that's how we're going to access the different applications that are available to us. So right now we're in our mail. We can access the drive. Yours may say documents at this time. Um, you can also access your calendar and contacts. Those are the ones that we're going to talk about today. Below that, you will see your search bar. So we'll talk about this in more depth later. But that's where you're going to go when you want to search for a particular message. Again, moving over to the right, it will show you who is logged in. And if you click that, you have the Add Account option. And then you also have the sign out option. You always want to make sure anytime you're signed into a web application that you make sure you sign out of it and not just close the X up in the right hand corner. Um, there may be a time that somebody could access your account if you do not log out, as well as it frees up system resources. So the, the system is still running if you have not logged out and that will make the system slower for others. Moving back over to the left, you have your mail with a drop-down arrow. If you click that drop-down arrow, you can also access your contacts and your tasks from here as well. Then moving over to the right, you have your action buttons. Now at this time, when I don't have a message selected, I'm only going to see these three action buttons. I see my selection button, where I can select all messages. That puts a checkbox in front of all the messages. I can select none, I can select all unread, which is obviously the bolded ones. So those are your different selection options. You can refresh, so you can refresh the inbox if you're waiting for a message to come in and you don't see it. Underneath more, the only option you have here at this point is to mark all as unread. So that would unbold every message. Moving on over to the right, you can see I'm viewing one of 11 messages. By default, there will be 50 messages per page. So if I had more than 50, I can use this arrow off to the right to get to those older messages. The next button over is your settings button. So when we want to customize our account, this is where we're going to go to change those settings. Moving back over to the left, you have your compose button. So that's where we're going to go to create a new message. Below that, you will have your inbox. So anytime you need to get back to your inbox, you can always click on inbox at the left-hand side here. The system has set up some default filters for you. So you can view all the starred messages. So that's going to show only messages that have been starred by me. Any important messages, which are shown with the filled in tag. Any of my chats that I have done within the system, my sent mail, and my drafts. Below those defaults, you will see your labels, or what used to be folders in the old system. Scrolling on down towards the bottom, you will have your chat area. At the very bottom left-hand corner, you have your chat toggle button. So if you click on this button, it will hide the chat area, click on it again, and then that chat area will come back. I do have this adjustable section bar here, this gray bar, that I can take and move up and down. So if I click on that to open it, I can use the adjustable section bar to make my chat area bigger or smaller.
Then moving on over to the right, you have your messages. In front of each message, you will have a checkbox, a star, and the important tag. Then it will show who the message is coming from, the subject of the message, and what they call a snippet of the message. So a snippet of the message is going to show basically the first part of the message body. So you can see what the message is saying. Yes? We'll get there. Um, so if we check the checkbox in front of one of our messages, we are going to get additional action buttons that go across the top. So again, our first one is going to be our selection button. The next button over is your archive button. So we do not have one of these in the old system. What this will do is if I want to take this message, and let's say I may need it in the future. I don't really have a label that I want to organize it in, but I'm done with it. I want to clean out my inbox. I can choose to archive it. What that will do is that will move it to, actually takes off the inbox label and it will show underneath all mail. On, all mail is underneath, if I scroll down in my label list here, so I'll scroll down and select more. When I click on more, I'll have to scroll down again because I have a lot of labels. And then I select all mail. So all mail consists of everything inside of my account. It's everything that's currently in my inbox. It's everything that's in my drafts, in my sent, and in my labels. Everything except for the trash. So all mail is going to be everything except trash. So when you archive something, you're basically telling it, I don't want it to show in my inbox anymore. Just show in all mail. Not really. You can, if you're putting a label on it, then you can view it when you click on that label. But it really lives in all mail. It's just a way for you to view it when you label it. Um, the next button over is your report spam. So if something comes in at spam, go ahead and feel free to report it as spam. The next one over is your delete button. So if you delete a message, that will move it to the trash. It will stay in the trash for 30 days and then it's gone for good. The trash automatically will get cleaned out after 30 days. So that's something to be careful of. Um, in the old system, I used to put things in the trash and just leave them there and it would stay there. So that's kind of like what the archive is basically right now. So instead of using your trash, if you know that you may need something and you don't want it to be cleaned out, use the archive option instead. Your next one over is your move to. So this is the button that you will use when you want to move a message to a label. And we'll do that a little bit later. The next one over is your label. So if I want to add additional labels, because again, labels have different functionality than a folder. You can have a message that has more than one label on it. And you can see this one right here has multiple labels on it. So that message pertains to more than one of my label topics. Underneath more, you can mark it as red. So this particular message is bolded. It's not red. I can mark it as red. If I would select the checkbox in front of a, a unread one, um, or a red one, I would have the option to mark it as unread. You can mark messages as important. So you can tell it if it's important to you. Now the important tag will show in front of each message. So that's this little tag right here. If it is filled in, that means it's marked as important. If it's cleared out, it's not important. You will notice messages coming into your account that are already marked as important for you. It's going to be based on your account activity. So for instance, if a message comes in, it's only sent to you, it's going to be marked as important because you're the only person getting it. So therefore, you're the only one who needs to do something with it. So the system controls these tags you can start to train the system by telling it what is or is not important by turning those tags on and off. So if this message was not important to me, I would click it and that would turn it off. Click it again, that would turn it back on. So again, the system will start tracking what you tag as important. So you can mark it as important through here. 
Or you can, again, click on the tag right in front of it. No. You can add it to your task list. So if I have to do something with this particular message, let's say I want to archive it, I want it out of my inbox, but I really don't want to forget about it, I can add it to my task list, which is like a to-do list that shows up in the bottom right corner of my account or of my screen. Um, you check the checkbox in front of the message you want to add, and then underneath more, you say add to tasks. So that's one way. We'll talk about a couple of other ways to add tasks just manually, type them in. You can remove a star. So for instance, this particular message that I have checked, I have marked it with a star. And the star is in front of the important tag. The star is your flag for follow-up. So flag for follow-up was in the old system. It's a way for you to flag something to remind yourself to do something with that particular message. By default, you will only have one star turned on. I will show you how to turn additional icons on, and then you can choose which ones you want to use for what purposes. So you can see that I have a check mark here. Maybe I'm done with this, I completed it. This one is marked with an exclamation point. Maybe that's one I need to really follow up on today. And then these are just regular stars. Maybe those are you know, something I need to follow up on sometime throughout the week. So you can kind of think about it however you want to um, use those different icons. You can filter messages like these. So if I select filter messages like these next to this message from Christine, it's going to open up my search box and say, you want to filter messages that are from the person that I have checked the box for. And we'll talk more in detail about what filters do. But that's a fast way to create a filter. So again, if you have, let's say, a message coming in from somebody and you want to create a filter off of that so it goes to a different spot um, instead of coming to the inbox, you can do that quickly by selecting that particular message. And then the last option under more is to mute. So if I choose to mute this conversation, let's say somebody keeps including me in the message I really don't need to be included in, um, I can mute that and it will go to all mail. It will bypass the inbox. So it's not coming directly in my inbox, right in my face right away. I can go back to all mail and view it if I need to. So that's what muting conversation will do. Are there any questions on your action buttons? Moving on to page eight, talking about the inbox. So you can change the way that your inbox looks as far as how much space is between each message if you want to make this a little bit bigger. So if I click the drop down in the right hand corner, um, the settings button, so I'm going to go to the right hand corner, click on settings. At the top, you're going to have your display density options of comfortable, cozy, or compact. So right now, mine is set to compact, which is the least amount of space between each message. I like to view as many messages as I can per page, so I've chosen to compact all these as close as they can be. So you can change yours to cozy or comfortable, whichever one you like to view. As I had mentioned earlier, your messages will show who the message is coming from, the subject, and a snippet of the message. So it's going to show you the very first sentence of the body of the message, or at least part of that first sentence. That is something that you can turn off. So it, it does get to be a little bit much to look at. Plus, if somebody comes up to your computer and is looking at you know, your, you have your email up, they can see basically part of a message um, that's not sent to them. So if you want to, you can turn snippets off and you do that underneath settings. So if I go up to my settings gear in the top right hand corner, and this time I'm going to select settings. It will take you to your general settings. So I'm going to go through just a couple of other settings that are shown here. 
under your maximum page size, it's 50 per page. You can view a minimum of 10 per page up to 100. Scrolling on down, you have conversation view. Conversation view is turned on by default. You can turn it off. Conversation view is what groups your messages together based on the subject. So if I send you a message that has a subject of training, you reply to it with that same subject, all of those messages will be grouped together. And we'll talk about conversation view in more detail and how to work with it. But that is something you can turn off if you absolutely cannot get used to it. And then your messages will come in one individual message at a time like they did in the old system. Here are your star options. So again, like I said, by default, you will have one star turned on. So you'll only have access to use this yellow star. You can turn on four stars or all stars. Scrolling on down, you can add a picture. There is an area for you to add your signature. If you've not done so and you want to add a signature, this is where you can do it. Then you will see snippets, which is what we were talking about just a little bit ago. That will, again, show a part of the message right within your inbox list. So if you don't want to show the snippets and you only want to show the subject and, of course, the sender, you can say no snippets. Below that is your vacation responder. So if you're going to be out of the office, it's usually nice for you to have a vacation message letting people know that so they will not expect a response from you. So you can add that. Anytime you make changes to your settings and you want to save them, make sure you select Save Changes at the bottom. So I'm going to cancel out of that. Yes. I'm not sure that's something I have to check, um, see if there's a setting for that. I can let you know. What's the keyboard shortcuts on and off? Um, whether you want to use keyboard shortcuts. So there's keyboard shortcuts that are assigned, I believe, to Gmail. Well, if you like shortcuts, if you're used to shortcuts. Um, okay. Moving on to page nine, your inbox styles. By default, your inbox is sorted with the most recent message at the top. If you want, you can sort them differently by going over to the inbox at the left-hand side here, clicking on the drop-down arrow at the right. So the different inbox types you have are classic, important first, unread, starred, or priority inbox. So if I do the unread first, that's obviously going to show all of my bolded messages at the top, all of the unread ones grouped together. Everything else will show below. Um, hover over the inbox at the left here, yeah. click the drop down arrow. Classic is the default, which again is the most recent at the top. Important first is going to be anything that you have tagged with that important um, tag at the front. Um, the priority inbox is going to be anything unread and important, anything starred, and then everything else. Any of these you can choose to collapse and expand. So I can click on the arrow there to collapse that since I don't have any in there, and I can click on it to expand it. So at any point in time, if you wanted to sort them, and then you can always go back to the classic view if you want to get back to that by clicking the drop down and selecting classic. On page 10, working with messages. So as I had mentioned earlier, by default, the conversation view is turned on which again is going to group your messages based on the subject. So if I have a subject, somebody replies to it, has the same subject, 
it's going to be grouped together inside of a conversation. So you'll notice this message from Emily here has a number seven behind it. So that means there are seven messages inside of this one conversation. And there's also a draft pending too. If I click on the message to open it up, and I discard the draft, the most recent message is going to be at the bottom and it will be expanded by default. These other messages you'll notice that are in gray are collapsed. If I want to expand any one of those particular messages, I can click on it. Click on it again and that will collapse it. If you wanted to expand all of them, you can do that by selecting the expand all at the top. So this is will expand all messages. I can read each individual one. You, yes, if you want to reply to a particular message, you're going to use the reply button off to the right. Yes. You'll notice next to each message you have the reply button. If you click the drop down arrow next to it, let me scroll down here, you will have reply. This particular message was sent to multiple people, so I have the reply all option. I'm sorry, Ms. Bridge, where did you open that up? Um, right here. You will only see the reply all option if it's sent to multiple people, though. So otherwise, it will only just be reply. You can forward the message. You can filter messages like these. You can print. If I choose print to the right of this message, it's only going to print this message itself, not the whole conversation. Same thing is true for delete this message, which is pretty important. It will only delete this portion of the message. It will not delete the whole conversation, which is all seven messages. If you want to delete the whole conversation, you're going to use the delete button at the top here. You can also mark the message as unread from here, which would rebold it. Scrolling back up to the top, if you did want to print all of the conversation, you can do that by selecting this print all. To the right of that, you have in new window. So if you want to work with this particular message in a separate window, you can select in new window. And that will open up that particular conversation in a separate window. As far as your action buttons that go across the top, you will have the first one that takes you back to your inbox. Um, the other ones we have already discussed. You can archive a message right from here, report it as spam, delete it, move it to a label, label it. Um, under more, the only real big different option you're going to see here is to create an event. So this would create an event on my calendar or on whoever calendar I want to add it to. So if I select create event, that opens up the new event window, adds my subject. So let's say this was a meeting and somebody was asking me if I could attend. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and set up the meeting I can attend. Um, or if I had to set up a training session, somebody said, can you please set up this training session? The thing to remember here is in the description, there will be part of the message so you can have um, which is kind of nice because, again, if somebody's asking you to set up a training on a particular day that's, or something on a particular day, that will show in the description. So then I can just go up here and change it to the date that they're asking me. It shows right in here. I don't have to remember and go back and forth between my calendar and this event. The important thing to remember, though, is it will automatically add the people that were included in the message as guests. So for instance, if this was a meeting and it was a meeting with these people, that's great. I would want to invite them to that meeting. If it's not and it's something that they're just basically asking me to take care of, I would want to make sure that I deleted them from the guest list so it doesn't invite them to this event. 
and then you would select save and that would save onto your calendar or the calendar again that you added it to but I'm going to discard this one for now if your message has attachments depending upon the type of attachment you will see a view option and download the view option will open it up for preview inside of Google Drive so it doesn't save it to Google Drive it just opens up a preview of it the download option is the option that you're used to normally which will download it with the actual application so it's going to download it with Word and it asks me if I want to open or save it Um, if you download it and open it, then you'd be able to print it there. Um, if you view it, I would think you could also print it. Yeah, print. When you have a message open, if you go up to the top, you will notice if it's tagged, it will show. If it's starred, it will show. And it's also going to show any labels that it has. And by default, all messages that come into your inbox come in with the inbox label. So basically, again, when you archive something, it removes this label for you, and it will just be showing in all mail. So it's not going to show in the inbox anymore. Going back to uh, the conversation view, yes. I've expanded it so that I can see all those messages in the conversation. Did you say there was a There is a reply option at the bottom here. And that replies to all of them? I believe so, yes. Well, the reply all, in this case, because in this particular message that Emily sent, um, she also sent, or I, one of us, also sent it to Brandon. So if you do reply all, it's going to take everybody inside of this whole, who's been in this whole conversation. So that would include Brandon then as well. That's what the reply all is. Okay. On page 14, if I need to move a message, I can either do that by dragging and dropping, or I can use that move to option. So let's say this particular message from Julie and this one from Chris. I want to move these, so I don't want them in my inbox anymore. I want to add a label to them. And I can do that by moving them. So I can either, again, check the checkbox in front of the ones I want to move and use this move to option and choose whichever one I want to move it to. Or I can drag and drop. So let's say these two messages, I want to drag and drop them and move them to 2012 communication. When you move a message, it will take off the label that you currently were looking at. So I was in my inbox, so it had the inbox label on it. It took the inbox label off and it put on the 2012 communication label. So you can see that if I open up a message, it has that label on it. So same thing is true here. If I take a message from the 2012 communication, I can see that's what it's that's the label I'm looking at currently. It's red on the left-hand side as well, but I can look up here. And I move it, it again is going to remove this label and put on the new one. So let's say I move it to class. So now that message is in there. So again, when you move a label, it takes off the label that you're moving it from, puts on the new label that you're moving it to. If I want to compose a new message on page 14, I'm going to select the Compose button. Now the way this system works is we no longer have to search the address book. We can just simply type the person's name in there. First name, last name, however you want to type it in. 
So I'm going to type in Tracy, or start typing in Tracy. And the options that are showing at the top here are going to be anybody that is in my contacts, anybody that I most contact, or other contacts that it tracks um, on my account. So it's going to be basically the people that you email the most are going to show at the top. And then you'll notice below the line, that's everybody else in the directory or, yeah, that would be everybody else in the directory that meets that criteria at this point. So it's going to search all of your contacts, most the most contacted people, and then it will search the directory. So I want to send a message to Tracy, and I also want to carbon copy Laura. So to carbon copy, I'm going to select this add CC. If you would want a BCC, you would select add BCC, which is blind carbon copy. Is everybody familiar with what blind carbon copy does? Um, blind carbon copy will send a message to the person, but the other people will not be able to see that that person's been copied. So you're basically hiding that you're actually sending that message to that person. A lot of faculty use that, instructors, um, for sending messages to like a group of students so that not everybody can see who the message went to. They just put it right in the blind carbon copy. You don't even have to put it, um, send it to anybody. You can just blind carbon copy by itself. So you might think you're the only one getting the message, but in fact, there might be a lot of people. Correct. Yep. Now the CC they will be able to see, but the BCC they won't. So if I do carbon copy Laura on this, Tracy will be able to see that. unless you ask that person and they tell you. Um, if you have groups set up, you can also send to that particular group. So if you set up, set up groups in your contacts, which we'll go through, um, all you would have to do to add that group is type, start typing in the group name. So you can see I have a training staff list group that we've created under this account. And it only has me in it, but... Um, I have an SIS list which has more people in it. So then it automatically adds those people to that list. But I'm going to delete some of these people. If I want to, I can ask for a return receipt so I know that somebody got this message. I can attach a file. So the way that this works is, again, if you're using Firefox or Chrome, you can drag and drop files. If you're using IE, you cannot drag and drop and you can drag and drop multiple files at a time. So if I want to drag and drop multiple files, let's say I don't have my window open, I would select this attach a file and navigate to the files that I want to add. But in this particular case, I already have my window open, my um, Windows Explorer window. So I'm going to open up that window. I have the files right here. I'm going to select the ones that I want by either using the control key or shift key. Shift key if they're in a consecutive order, control key if they're not. So I'm using my control key in this case. So it does work for IE and not Explorer? For Internet Explorer, you cannot drag and drop. Okay, just okay. Just Fire, well, pretty much any other browser I believe you can, okay. but I know for Firefox and Chrome for sure you can. Okay. So I can select these files, drag them, and as soon as I get them over here, it gives me this drop files here option. So I no longer have to do add one individually at a time. Again, if I forgot one, let's say I forgot this one, just drag it and drop it. Now with IE, you can still select multiple files. Um, you'll just select them here, and then you would have, you'd hit this attach a file, select the ones you want to add, I'm not going to add these, and select open. So you just can't drag and drop, but you can still do multiple. They should receive something saying that you're requesting that return receipt. I think something will pop up and ask them.
to say yes or no that they've got it. Um, you can also insert an invitation. So if I wanted to, let's say I'm setting up a meeting, I want to invite these people and I want it to automatically disappear on their calendar, they're going to get an invitation and they're going to be able to write from the email, say yes, no, or maybe that they're coming. They don't even have to go to their calendar. So let's say I want to invite these people to a meeting. I'm going to select insert invitation, put in what it is. So I'll just do IT staff meeting, choose the date and time. And then it will bring up the people involved. It will bring up their availability. So you can see at this particular time, um, the Titan Naps training is not available as well as Sarah and me. So that would not be a good time to have that particular event, obviously. You can see at noon, everybody is available. That's usually lunchtime, though. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you can choose, again, whose calendar you want to add it to. Normally, you're going to want to add it to your calendar. But if you are managing somebody else's calendar, maybe your supervisor's calendar, and they have given you access to add things to their calendar, you would click this drop down and choose that particular calendar that you want to add it to. Add a description where it's going to take place and then select insert invitation. So this is what it will look like. You can, when you click on it, you can edit it or delete it. So if you needed to make changes, you can go back in and edit it, select update invitation, or you can delete it. By default, everybody's free busy availability is turned on. We highly recommend everybody keep that on just because it's much easier to set up meetings with people if you can see they're free busy. So you're not seeing any details at all. You're just seeing busy and the time frame that's blocked out. By default, that was turned on on the old system as well. So the check availability was on by default, which some of us may not have even known. But Correct, yes. And that's what we hope for, but yes, everybody has to use it. <laughs> um, if you decided, for instance, one of these particular attachments you did not want to send, you simply click the checkbox and um, uncheck it, and then it will not send that message. You do have the toolbar that goes across the top here, so you can choose how you want to format, and then you also have your check spelling. I can also, if you notice on my account, you'll see that next to invitation, I have this canned responses option. So this is something I'll show you how you can turn on. Um, this is one of the labs. And labs are things in the system that are in testing and things that you can choose to turn off or on on your account. By default, all labs are turned off. And you choose which ones are going to be most helpful to you. So I'll show you where those are. But since we're in this particular message, I want to show you what this can do. So if I have a message that I send out frequently, I need to set up a templated message. I don't want to have to write this message out all of the time. It's very time consuming. I can use this canned response option. So I can say canned response. All of the canned responses that I've created will show at the top under insert. Then I have a saved area which includes new canned responses, so I can create new ones, and I can delete ones that I already have. So if I want to insert one of my canned responses, I will select that canned response. So here's an invitation that I inserted that also has text in it. You can insert multiple canned responses at one time as well. So let's say this message I want to send out, um, I want to add my campus signature. Canned responses are great for signatures as well, especially if, let's say, you are a student or you have multiple jobs. Um, you can have different signatures for your emails and just add them as a canned response quickly. That's under labs. Um, we'll get there in a little bit. It's under settings. I don't want to skip ahead too much yet. But I did want to show you, if you turn it on, that's where it's going to appear when you compose a new message. Um, 
we did use that really heavily on our training account. Um, we started a new student application electronically, and the students had to log in with their NetID. Well, what, a lot of students didn't have a clue what NetID was, so we were getting a lot of emails about that. And then also a lot of students were asking, what would I be doing in this particular job? So we typed up a bunch of different job descriptions for all the different jobs we had, and we could, I mean, it was a long description. We could just select the canned response for the job description and it's inserted, you just hit send. It's really, really slick. You will notice before I get out of this message that the draft has been saved. So it says draft auto saved at 946, which was one minute ago. If I would just navigate away from this message and I don't select discard, because discard would get rid of it, it would close it, it would not save it as a draft. So if I navigate away from it, it will be saved underneath my drafts. You can see there's 31 drafts here, because this account has just been used. Um, so to get back to that, I would simply click on that particular draft, and then I can save it when I need to. And then it's not in drafts anymore, it would be under sent. So do be careful with that, just because, again, if you navigate away from a message, you don't discard it, um, you thought that you sent it, it may still be under, and you didn't, it will be under your drafts. The other options that you have are to save now. So for instance, if I made a change and it hasn't saved it, I can select save now. I can also add labels to it as well. So if this message pertains to one of my labels, I can label it before it even goes out. And if somebody replies to it, and it has, again, that same subject, it's going to be labeled um, ahead of time. The reply will, reply yeah, the reply back will come into your inbox, and then um, it will still have the label, so it'll show in both spots. Really, it is only one message though. Um, here, you also have the option to open this in a new window. So, if I want to work with this message separately in a new window, I can do that. Moving on to page 16, talking about labels. As I had mentioned before, your labels will show at the left-hand side here. You will have, again, some default labels that they've created for you, um, your chats, actually a couple of defaults. Um, underneath more, you will have the default labels of all mail, spam, and trash. So again, your trash goes here. Your spam is here as well, so make sure that you go there every once in a while and check that. Um, if you have a particular message that is going into spam, that should not be. If you click the checkbox in front of it, in your action buttons across the top, you will see a not spam button. So you can mark something that, oh, there's my reminder. Um, you can mark something that is in spam and say it's not spam. If you need to view a message that is, has a particular label, so I want to view all the messages that have the fall 2012 label, I can simply click on it at the left hand side. Oh, well, there is none in there. There is some in miscellaneous emails. So these are the messages that have the label of miscellaneous emails. If I need to create a new label, I can do that by clicking on more at the bottom left hand side here, drag all the way down and select create new label. So I get my new label box and I can type in that new label. If I want to, I can nest this label under a label that I currently have. So it's basically like a sub label. I would check the checkbox in front of it and let's say biology 101, I want it to go under fall 2012. And I click the drop down here and choose fall 2012. And then select create. And now that's underneath that label. Can you manage the labels you have already, like when you have moved to another one? So it falls under one to say. Mm -hmm. So like biology 101, if I wanted to, I can nest it by clicking this drop down, actually you would edit is what you would do. So we'll 
Yeah, we'll get there. Sorry. I, I'm not seeing that more. I mean, I see one more which gives me chats, all mail, spam, trash, but I don't see another. I don't see the more to get the latest. Are you scrolled all the way to the bottom? You should see only one more, but at the very bottom left corner, oh, click more. There you go. Create new label. Oh. You're welcome. Are there any questions on creating labels? If I have a particular message that's already labeled, so like this message from Emily is labeled with my miscellaneous, I can see that by looking up here. It's also labeled with follow-up and priority. If I open it up, I can see all three labels here. If I want to add another label to this, I can click the label drop-down and choose that particular label. So let's say it pertains to class. Click the checkbox in front of it and then select apply. Now it has four labels. So I will be able to view it in any of these four labels. The one thing to remember about this is that even though this message has four labels and it will show in all four spots, it is only still one message. So therefore, if you delete it, it is going to be in the trash. It's not going to be in any of those four spots. If you need to rename your labels, you can do that by hovering over the label at the left-hand side here and clicking the drop-down arrow. And that would be at the bottom under Edit. So under Edit, that would open up that label. And again, this is where, let's say that you nested this and you wanted to put it somewhere else. Um, you can do that by selecting where you want to put it and then select Save. If you need to remove a label from a message, there's, again, of course, multiple ways to do it. But if I have that message open, I can do it quickly by selecting the box, their X right next to that particular label. So if I want to get rid of priority, I can select that box. And then it will tell me this label has been removed. Or, of course, you could use that label dropdown to do it, too. Again, if you do it here, you just want to always make sure you hit apply. So if I uncheck class, I want to make sure I hit apply if I want to get rid of that label. What if you only had one label, like inbox, and you, and you deleted it from that, from that label? Where would that email be then? It would be an all mail. So anytime that you have a message and it has basically no labels, it's going to still show underneath all mail. If you need to delete a label from your label list at the left-hand side, again, you can click the drop-down arrow and select Remove Label at the bottom. So that will actually delete the label. It will not, again, delete the messages that are inside of that particular label. So under my miscellaneous, it would not, if I wanted to remove that particular label, I click the drop-down and selected Remove Label. It will not delete these. It's, again, just going to remove that label from each message and only that label. So it will still keep the other labels that are attached to it. If you did want to delete those messages, you don't want them anymore, you don't want anything that has to do with that label, you'd want to delete those ahead and then remove the label. So you'd have to check the checkbox in front of all of them and then say delete and then you would go over at the left-hand side here and select Remove Label. You can also organize your labels by adding colors to them. So you'll notice that some of these labels, I do have colors attached to them. So my follow-up is this yellowish-orange color. 
my fall 2012 biology is blue and my class is gray. So you can add whatever color you want to your labels, again, by just clicking the drop-down arrow and choosing a particular color. You can see the colors that are assigned to those different labels. You can also hide your labels from the label list. So let's say that I have old labels. In my regular account, I had labels that were from 0506. So I actually tagged them with the particular fiscal year. Those I don't, let's say I don't want to get rid of, I may need to go back to them at some point. Um, but I can hide them so that they're not automatically showing up here. If you hide a label, it's going to show underneath more. So Again, the ones that you're seeing by default under more already are all mail, spam, and trash. We also hid projects. So in order to hide a label, you would hover over that label, click the drop-down arrow at the right, and you would select under in label list, you're going to select hide. So I hid the class label, and now it shows underneath more. Now, you cannot hide these default um, options that they have set up for you unless you do that underneath Manage Labels. And so to access Manage Labels, you can do that by scrolling all the way to the bottom, clicking on More, scroll all the way to the bottom again, and then select Manage Labels. So Manage Labels takes you into your settings of your labels. We already talked about the general settings earlier, so now it just takes us directly to the label settings. So you can hide any of these that you don't want to see, or you can show any of them that you do. So again, by default, all mail, spam, and trash are hidden. If you want to access those more quickly, you can choose to show them, and they will show up in the regular label area. Any of the ones that you've created will show below, and again, you can choose to show or hide those, remove or edit them as well. And you can create new labels from here too. Are there any questions on labels? Okay. I'm going to click back on inbox at the left hand side here. And on page 21 we're going to talk about searching for messages. So you'll have the search bar that goes across the top here. If I click in that bar and I type, it's going to search everything. It's going to search my whole account, first of all. It's going to search the from, the subject, and in the body of the message. So if I just type in Titan here, first of all, it's going to ask me if I want to search one of those options that are showing in the drop down here. And if I don't, that's fine. I can simply select my search button at the right. So I want to search for everything that has the word Titan in it. Again, it could be the sender, it could be the subject, it could be in the body of the message in my whole account. So you can see I have a lot, I have 88 that come up. If there are any messages that are in the trash, it will separate those out and it will say, Deleted messages meet your search. Do you want to view them or trash them? So I'll select view them and then it basically takes me to my trash and shows me what's in here. I can return to that normal search by clicking here and it takes me back to the regular messages in my account that meet that criteria. So like I said, it's searching all of those different things. It's searching the sender, subject, and body. If I click the drop down arrow here, I can choose to narrow that criteria down a little bit further. So let's say I really want to search for messages from Brandon. So I'm going to start typing out his email, and this is him. And I do want to leave ha has the words. So I do want to search for messages from Brandon that have the word Titan in them. I'm going to select my search bar button in the bottom left corner. 
So that narrowed it down a lot. There's only one message from Brandon that has the word Titan in it. So again, if you click that drop down arrow at the end of the search bar, that will give you the additional criteria of from to subject has the words, doesn't have the words. Um, you can also check the box for has an attachment. So again, that would only obviously bring up messages that have attachments. Um, that one is handy. Uh, or you can search within a specific period of time. So if you want to do that, you just have to make sure you put a date in here. And here's an example. So I'm going to go back to my search of has the word Titan in it. I have 88 that meet that criteria right now in my account. And let's say anything that comes in with the word Titan in it, I want to filter that. I don't want it to come to my inbox. I want it to go to a label called Titan. I can click the drop down arrow here. I've already ran the search. It shows me I have 28. I can see create filter with this search. And then I need to choose what do I want to do with it. Um, I want to skip the inbox and archive it. I can mark them as red. I can star them. I can also apply a label. So this is a really good one for, let's say, the announcements. Let's say you really want to be on the announcement list because there are good announcements in there that you look at, but you don't want them coming to your inbox. You could create a filter that automatically applies a label of announcements. And then whenever you have time, you can go ahead and go to that label and look at those particular announcements. Another good reason for this uh, filter as well is let's say that you have a form set up and people are submitting that form electronically. If you have it set up with a particular subject, you could have it going to a label. So for instance, for our student applications, I do have those electronic submissions coming to our email, but we really don't look at them through email. We actually go to the website to look at them. But I have them coming through email just as kind of a backup in case something would happen with one of the submissions. Um, and I have it filtering to the student application label. So they don't even come to my inbox. I don't have to read them if I don't want to. Um, but a lot of times, if I have that account up, I'll just go there and see, ooh, there is a student application that was submitted. I need to go and follow up on that and take care of it. So then you would select Create Filter. If you want to apply the filter to the conversations that currently exist, so there's 88 of them that currently exist, you would have to check the checkbox in front of it, and then it will automatically apply that filter to those. Otherwise, it will only apply the filter to anything coming in after the filter is created. If you need to edit your filters, that is done underneath settings. So to get to settings, you're going to go off to the right hand side, click on your settings gear, drag down and select settings. And then across the top, you have filters. So you go ahead and click on filters. At the top, it's going to show you any filters that you've created. Next to each filter, you will have an edit and a delete option. So if you ever need to make changes to it. And then at the bottom, you also have a create new filter option here as well. On page 22, talking about labs, which I had mentioned earlier, labs, again, are things that were created that are in testing that you can choose to turn on in your account. So to access labs, that's also underneath settings. So if you're not underneath settings, you can click on your settings gear at the right-hand side here, drag down, and select settings. And then across the top, you want to select labs, which is towards the end. So the labs will be organized in alphabetical order. Um, if you know a particular name of a lab, so let's say you want that canned response one and you want to turn it on, in this search for lab box, you can just start typing out the name of it. So for canned response, you would type in C-A-N-N-E-D and it should come up towards the top. If you want to turn it on, you're going to select enable. 
any labs that have been enabled will then, by default, show at the top. So any labs that you enable will show at the top. And then again, everything else is going to be alphabetical. There are descriptions next to the lab, so you can re read what that particular lab pertains to. Again, you can choose to enable it. You can always disable later. Um, the thing to remember with labs is they are in testing, which means that they can break at any time. They can have bugs. They can change at any time. Um, they can be gone at any time. Or they can choose to make them part of the system as well. So they can just basically turn it on for you. There are different labs for calendar, so that would be underneath your calendar settings. So these are only labs for email, contacts, task, and chat. Um, another lab that I really like, especially if you're going to use your chat, is to use the right side of chat. So if I just start typing in right, um, here's my right side of chat. So if I choose to enable that, and then of course select save changes at the bottom here, Now instead of my chat area at the bottom left hand side taking up the label area, it's moved over to the right. Are there any questions on the email portion? Moving on to page 24, talking about contacts. There's two different ways that you can access your contacts. You can either click on contacts in the application bar across the top here. That would open it up in a separate tab or window. Or if I'm in my email, click on my email tab, I can click on the mail drop down at the left hand side here and choose contacts. If I do it this way, it's going to open up contacts right over the top of my email. So then I'd have to click on contacts and click on mail to get back to mail. I like it this way because then I can close my contacts whenever I want to. So I just usually open it in a separate window or tab. Across the top, you have your search bar like we did before. So that's not changed. Um, and then you can have your action buttons. Your very first action button is to select all. So that would check the checkbox in front of all of your contacts or none. You have your add to my contacts. So this is a fast and easy way that you can simply just type an email address in there and it adds to your my contacts. Underneath more, um, you can sort by first name, last name. That's the only one that we're really going to talk about. If you had more contacts than what would take up this page. Again, you would have that next arrow to go to the next page. By default, it shows 250 contacts per page. At the left-hand side, you have your new contacts button. So this is where you can go to add a brand new contact. You have your my contacts below that. So this is going to be anybody that was in your personal contacts before. And you can see there's eight contacts currently in my contacts. If you have any groups, they will show below. So you can see I have a couple different groups showing. And then the number of staff or the number of emails that are in that group. You will also have a most contacted and other contacts. That's tracked by the system. And then your directory is at the bottom. And that's going to be everybody on campus, faculty, staff, and students. Yes, you can sort it by last name if you want to. Yes, underneath more. Do you see that in the options? And then you would say last name. Oh, right. The directory you can't switch. You can't. And then um, my contacts at the left hand side here. So if I go back to my contacts, let's say I want to add a brand new contact. I'm going to go to my new contact button. 
There's a couple of different ways that I can do this. I can type in the person's name, type in the email address. If it is somebody on campus and let's say I do know their email address, I can go directly to this email address field and type that in. And then when I navigate outside of that particular field, it will automatically save it for me as soon as I navigate outside of that field. If it is somebody on campus, it automatically adds their name and it gives me their directory profile at the bottom, which includes the department they work in and the area they work in, location and phone number. That's all I did was put in the email address. If you don't know their email address and you want to add them to your contact list, you can do that from the directory. So you would select directory at the left hand side here. And you can, again, either search by first name, last name, whichever is going to make most sense. So let's say I want to search for Smith. I'm going to type it in and select my search button here. Choose the particular person that I want to add. So I'm going to click the checkbox in front of the name. And then I have a button that says add to my contacts. So either way, you can add them by using the new contact button or searching the directory. If you need to edit a contact, so I'm going to go back to my contacts list. Let's say I want to make a change to Tracy. I'm going to simply click right on Tracy's name. That will open it up, and I can make that change. So if I wanted to add her phone number here, mobile phone number, I'll just Again, as soon as I navigate outside of it, it will save it. If I don't, I do have the Save Now option in the top right-hand corner. So I can select Save Now. If I need to delete a contact, I can do that by clicking the More drop-down here. So I can either do that by being in the list of my contacts, selecting the contact and then selecting more and say delete contacts. The thing to be very careful of here is notice next to Tracy at the right hand side, she is part of the SIS list, which is a group that I've created. If I delete her, it's going to delete her from that group as well. So let's say I really don't want her to be in my contacts, but she is still part of that group. I can select the checkbox in front of her name and then I can go up to the group button, click the drop down, uncheck the box in front of my contacts, and select apply. So now she doesn't appear here, but she will appear in the SIS list. Just right there. If you need to create a new group, you can do that by selecting new group at the bottom left hand corner here and typing in that group name. And then select OK. So if I want to add people to that group, again, there's a couple different ways to do it. If they're already in my contacts, I can simply check the checkbox in front of those or that person that I want to add to that group. Use my group dropdown and check the checkbox in front of the group I want to add them to and select Apply. If they are not part of my contacts, and let's say they are in the directory, I can again go to the directory, search for that particular person, check the checkbox in front of their name, and use my group button to add them to that particular group, and select apply. Now the thing to remember here is if you do it this way and you add them to that group from the directory or any group, if you add a person to any group, it automatically adds them to your contact list as well. So you would have to go back and uncheck that you wanted them to be taken out of the contact list. So now Sarah's here twice. So you would uncheck this box and select apply. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
I'd hope not, but um, if you want to add somebody, let's say they're not part of campus, if they're totally off campus, you can do that by going to that group. So let's say my SIS list, and you know their email address, you can simply type that in here. So I'll list, I'll list you mine. Doesn't matter, it's on campus, but, and then select add. And again, if they are part of campus, automatically going to put in their information. Are there any questions on working with contacts? Then moving on to page 27. I'm going to close out of my contacts here. Go back to my mail. You can access your tasks by clicking on mail in the top left hand corner here and then selecting tasks. Yes. So within the task window here, you have your minimize button. So this will minimize it down to the bottom. Basically kind of hides it. Maximize will show it. You have the arrow, if you click on it, will pop it out in a separate window. You can pop it back in by selecting pop in, and that will go back to the bottom right corner. I'm sorry, how did you get to tasks? Um, if you click on, yep, mail and then task. You have the X that will close it. So again, anytime you close it, you will have to go back up to Mail and select Task to reopen. Your task window will stay however you leave it. So if you leave your account and you sign out, that window's open. It's going to be open the next time you come into it. I already showed you how you could add a task through email. Again, by just simply clicking the checkbox in front of it and saying Mower and add to tasks. You can also add it individually by typing it in. So if I want to add a task, I can either click in any blank area or I can select the plus sign. And then I can type out what I want to do. If I want to add more detail, I can select the arrow off to the right. I can choose a particular due date. Let's say this is due October 2nd. I can add notes to it. Um, by adding a due date that does not send a reminder. Um, so you can add a due date. You can sort by due date if you want to. Um, you can add notes. You will have this move to list option. So by default, it's going to add it to this list that I currently have up here, my training projects list, unless I choose a different list. There's another reminder. By default, you will only have one list that was created with your account. So it's going to be your account name, and that's going to be your task list, um, which in this case would be this one on my account. And if I select back, so now that's been added, oops, well, I added it to my projects list, that's fine. So that's how you can add your tasks. Underneath actions, you have the option to indent, unindent, so you can kind of move them around however you want, move them up and down, edit the details, which is going to open up that detail window. You can email the task list either to yourself or to somebody else. You can print it. Uh, you can view your completed tasks. You can sort, again, by a particular due date if you've added due dates. Or you can clear, clear all of your completed tasks. Uh, it just moves it, so it indents it a little bit. Yeah. And then move up or down would move them up and down. Should. I think you have to select it first, though. Doesn't seem to do much, really. How do you uh, edit your data and change the data? Um, you would open the details. So you could do that either by clicking on it and selecting um, Edit Details, or you can click on the arrow here and then choose that different date.
You can also, if I go back to my task list, if I want to delete something, I can click on it to make sure that it's highlighted and click on my delete button. So that will move it to the trash. I can view recently deleted items once I've done that. So this is going to show me anything that I currently had recently deleted. If I want to get it back, I can select this arrow and that will put it back on my regular task list. Um, that's what I was told, but there are items in my apps list. So if I just delete this one. Back from June. So it seems to stay on there for a very long time. The next button over in the very bottom right hand corner is the button where you can add additional task lists. So if you have particular projects that you're working on, you can add separate task lists to keep track of those. Yep, or you can do a weekly list or let's say every Friday you have certain duties that you want, um, you can add those lists. So I can say add list and let's say um, we'll do tasks for Friday. Select OK, and so now I have that separate list created. So I can either be directly on that list when I want to create something new, and I need to refresh this because it's... If you ever have that where it's showing that that, temp that list is temporarily not available, um, you can just refresh your browser, and then it should come back up and be fine. So it doesn't look like it created my new list. Except okay. So again, I can either click on it here or I can add that new option here. Um, no. It's only one window. To get to a different list, you would select the button in the bottom right corner to switch to a different list and then you would choose whichever list you want. So if I want to go back to my apps training list, I click on that. Also, if you click on this switch list button, um, if you say delete list or rename or refresh, that is going to do that action to the particular list that you're currently looking at. So if I say delete, it's going to delete, delete the apps training list. Any questions on tasks? I found it very useful when I was working on a project, or actually a couple of projects, and having a hard time keeping things straight on each separate project, um, and having sticky notes all over the place. I finally gave up on the sticky notes and said I need to have it all in one spot. I'm not finding things, and set up the separate task list for each of those projects. Okay. On page 28, talking about chat. Again, by default, your chat will show in the bottom left-hand corner. I've used a lab to move mine over to the right side. The first thing you want to be aware of is your chat status. So you can see next to my little icon here, I have a green circle. That means that I'm currently available, but I do have in writing here that I'm in training. If I click this drop-down, I choose which type of chat status I want to be showing everybody. Am I available? And then I don't have anything written. Uh, if I'm in training, I can do that. If I want to be busy so that I'm shown as away, I can select busy. So that's going to be that little red circle. If I'm invisible, that means I'm shown as offline, but I can still send chats out. So I can still send chats to people I have not signed out, but people will see me as offline. How does it, is that the customized option to stay like in training? Or yes. Mm -hmm. You can sign out of chat, and then obviously you wouldn't be able to send chats. You're going to show as offline. So that's your chat status. Um, your chat status is going to stay however you left it last. So if I leave it as busy, I log out, come back in, I'm going to be busy. So if you want to make sure that you change that when you leave your desk. 
if I want to send a chat to somebody that I've never chatted with before, I'm going to select the search people box. And here I just simply have to search for the person's name. So again, I'm going to use Tracy as an example. And I've never chatted with Tracy before from this account. So next to Tracy, I would say invite to chat. That will send her a little dialog box that she'll see in the right hand side here. And it will say so and so wants to chat with you. And then she will have to say yes or no that she will chat with me. And that shows up in the middle of page 28, that little chat box on the handout. If somebody is already in your chat list that you've chatted with before and you want to chat with them right now, you can simply do that by clicking on their name. So I can see Lynn is available. I want to ask her a question. I can click on her name and the chat box shows in the bottom here. So the chat box works very similar to the task list as far as the minimizing, maximizing, popping out, popping back in, and closing. So I would type my message to Lynn. And hit my enter key. And then she would receive that message and she would be able to reply. So it's a little bit quicker than sending an email because not everybody will look at their email right away. Um, so as soon as I hit my enter key, she could reply to me. If I wanted to invite others, so there's multiple people that I wanted to attend this meeting, I can select this add people to chat. And then again, type that person's name in there and select invite, but I'm not going to. I'll just close that out. You will notice that people will automatically show in your chat list, even if you have not asked to chat with them because of people that you email. So your chat list starts to be built off of people that you email. So if you see somebody in your chat list that you really never think you're going to chat with, you can click the drop down arrow next to them or hover over them, then click the drop down arrow here and choose never show. And then that person will disappear from the chat list. And if I want to, if I do something on chat with them, it's going to search. Yes. Are there any questions on chatting? Chat is something that you can turn off. So if it's something that you decide you're not going to use, you don't want to be shown as available, you just don't want to deal with the chat at all, you can shut it off underneath settings. So if you click on your settings gear, select settings, it's thinking, um, and then you would choose your chat settings. So chat right here. So by default it's on, you can say you want to turn it off, then it will not show. By default it also saves your chat history. So if you don't want to save your chat history, you can say never save chat history. Um, I actually like mine turned on because then sometimes if I'm chatting with somebody and they say if I need help with something, they'll say go to this link and you can access the help for whatever I need help with. Um, I can always go back to that chat and get that link back. So if I need to get back to it again. And that would be saved underneath your chats at the left hand side here. So these are all the chats that have been um, created on this account. Are there any questions on email, contacts, task, or chat? Okay. We are going to talk about calendar next. So if you do want to, you can stay for that. If you don't think you'll use the calendar, um, feel free to go. You can still take a calendar handout if you want. And then again, I'm going to do a brief, just brief introduction of Drive, too. So if you want to take just a quick five-minute break, come back about 10.35. It's where you can put documents out there that you can access online. So you can access it anytime in your 
in your Titan Apps account. Um, different. You can also share with people as well, and it's real-time collaboration. So you could be in the document, I can be in the document, we can be making changes at the same time, and I can see what you're doing. Five gigabytes, I believe. Can we get more? I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah, that's just the default that Google gives you is five gigabytes, and I think that's all they give you. Were you able to, um, do you grab the handouts and everything? I actually went to a session earlier. Okay. This summer, where I was actually showing you how to save the first half. Oh, okay. So I stayed until this time, break time. So it's perfect because now I can catch the second half. Okay, good. So I good. Got, um, that one's email. Um, do you have the calendar? Okay. Okay, yep. Mm -hmm. That's okay. No problem. Oh, they must have shut the door all the way. That's okay.
What? Okay, we'll go ahead and get started and talk about calendar. So the first thing you need to know is how to access the calendar. And again, you would do that simply by clicking on calendar in the application bar across the top. That will open up a separate tab or a separate window, depending upon your browser that you're using. You'll have your search bar that goes across the top here. Towards the right hand side, you have the option of how you want to view the calendar. Do you want to view it in the day, so just today's day, week, month, five days, an agenda, which is more like a list. And then underneath more, you also have the option to print. So for any reason, if you need to print your calendar, you can do that here. To the right of that, you will have, again, your settings button. So that will be the settings for your calendar. Now go back to my week view. That's the view I like to see. I think it's just the settings. That's something you can change underneath settings. first time you've ever accessed it. That's the default. It's fine. There. Going back over to the left-hand side, since I have mine arranged in the week view, I can move to the next week by using this arrow to the right. So that will take me to the next week and so on. If I need to get back to today, I can click on the today button. So that will, again, get me back to this week. Over at the left-hand side, I have my create. So this is where I can go to create a new event. Below that, I have my mini calendar. So if I need to get to a date in the future really quickly, I can go to that month by using the arrows, clicking on the date. So let's say I want to go to December 18th. And it's going to take me to that particular week. Click back on today, and that will take me to this week. We'll get there. On the left-hand side, you'll see my calendars. And then below that will be all the calendars that you have created or that you are owner of. Um, by default, there will be the default one created for you. So mine is my Titan Apps Training. Scrolling on down under other calendars, this will be calendars anybody that has shared with you. So if somebody shares with you, they automatically will appear underneath other calendars. It will also be calendars that you choose to subscribe to or that you choose to view. And I'll tell you how to use that um, and add calendars to it. But the first thing we want to do is we want to create a new event. There's a couple different ways to do it. You can either select the Create button in the top left-hand corner, or if you know the particular event date and time, this will save a little bit of time if you actually go directly to that date and time. So let's say on Thursday at 10 o'clock, I want to add an event. I'm going to click right on the calendar. So it sticks the date and time in there for me, and I can put what it is that I'm going to be doing. Choose which particular calendar I want to add it to. Again, this is important if you are managing somebody else's calendar and you have access to add, you want to make sure you choose that particular calendar if it's an event for them. My default meeting length is set for an hour. So if I only wanted it to set this meeting up for an hour, I didn't want to add any other details, I could select create event and that's automatically just going to add it to my calendar. If I do want to add additional details, I'm going to select this Edit Event. 
Again, by doing it this way, it saves me a little bit of time. I don't have to insert the date and time because I already clicked on it. Um, if it happened to go longer, I could select that time by clicking the drop down and choosing, let's say this is till an hour and a half, 1130. If it is an all day event, you would select all day. That will appear at the very top of your calendar and then it will obviously get rid of the times. If it is a repeating event, you would select repeat and then we, you will get the dialog box up and you choose when you want it to repeat. So again, if you had something like a weekly meeting um, or let's say it's every other week, then you would choose every two weeks. But if it's kind of like not, not every other week, it's every third or every fourth or then you have to make it every time. Well, if it's every third, you would say every third. Weekly, every third week. Um, you also have the option of saying that it's every weekday, um, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and so on. So you can kind of use these different options and see if that reoccurring will work for you or not. Um, choose whether you want it to end at a particular time. And then select Done. And then this will, once we save it, it would be created as a reoccurring event. Under your event details, we would want to put where the event's going to take place. Again, whose calendar you want to add it to. Normally it'd be yours unless you're managing somebody else's. Add a description. You can also add attachments. So if you're going to have an agenda for the meeting, you could add that as an attachment and then people can access it. You can add a particular color to your events. So maybe all of your staff meetings are going to be yellow and then all of your other type of meetings will be different colors. So you can color code those to whichever you like. The default reminder is a pop-up. So I will get a pop-up 10 minutes before this particular meeting as long as I leave this on and as long as I have my calendar application open. If I do not have my calendar application open, I'm not going to get a pop-up if I'm just viewing my email. So that's important to remember. You can choose to get a different type of reminder if you want to by clicking on the drop-down here. So let's say I'd rather have an email reminder an hour before. Yes under your notifications, which is under settings, and I'll show you where that is when we go under settings. You can also choose to just delete it. So like for this instance, let's say for this particular event, I do not want a reminder, I can click the X and that will get rid of it. Or I can have multiple reminders. So I can have two different reminders. I can do a pop-up and I can do an email if I want. whether I want to show myself as available or busy. So if I'm going to be busy, I want to show myself as busy. Um, the only time you'd really probably mark available is let's say that you are using your calendar to remind yourself of something um, that's going on during the day that you may want to attend or you may not. Um, so you can mark yourself as available and then again if somebody wants to set up a meeting with you, you will not, they will not see that you're busy at that time. Under privacy, it's set up as default. So what that means is that if I leave this as default and everybody on campus has my free busy availability and I marked it as busy, they're going to see I'm busy, which is fine. If I have given somebody particular permissions to read my calendar and I leave it as default, they are going to be able to read this particular event. If I don't want that person to read it, I'm going to mark it as private. Then they will not be able to read it. They will just see busy like everybody else. And then public would be public to everybody in the world, so you normally don't want to use that option. For each individual one, if you wanted something to be private, you would have to mark it as private. So default is the normal setting of, again, anybody can see your free busy. And if you give people specific permissions, they will have those permissions um, if default is selected. Is 
like automatically do it for you? Yeah. Not that I'm aware of. Underneath guest at the right hand side here, it says enter email address. You don't have to enter the email address. You can, again, just type in the person's name and it will search the directory. So if I want to invite some staff to this meeting, I can either type in, again, their name, or if I already have a group set up, let's say we have a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting, I have a group already set up, so I'll just do the SIS list. Yes, it pulls out of your email groups. So these are all the people that are part of that group. If there's additional people that you need to add, again, you can do that by simply just typing in that individual person. If you want to mark somebody as optional, so you want to show that they're optional, you would click on the person in front of that person's name. So that would mean Andy is marked as optional. That they don't like you, they're not required to attend. Yes. There is an X to the right of each person, so that's how you could remove them from the list or after each person. I'm going to get rid of a couple of these people. It depends upon if they've given you permissions. If somebody's invited you, it will automatically appear on your calendar. Um, you can choose to decline it if you don't want to come. And then declined appointments will automatically show with a line through them. But underneath settings, you can change it so that they just come off if you decline them. So let me get rid of a couple of people. Oh, I want Tracy back on there. Now let's say I didn't go and check these people's calendars ahead of time. Um, I want to do that now and I want to see if they can meet at this date and time. A fast way to do that would be to select the suggested times link. So it's going to go and look at that particular date and time that I chose and say Thursday the 27th at 1 o'clock will be the soonest that everybody can meet based on their calendar availability. Another way to view it in a more visual representation, which I like better, is this Find a Time tab. So if I click on Find a Time, so it shows me at that date and time, I can see if I look over on the side here, that Tracy and likely Brandon are both um, busy. And if I hover over, I can see who's busy. Um, also, I'm busy at that time. So here you can actually move to the next day, you can move to the week. So if I wanted to view just the whole week and get a, a visual overview of can we meet this week at all, um, I can do that by selecting the week. And then you can use the arrows, maybe this week is not good, I can move it to the next week. So going back to the event details. Um, so again, if we use our calendars, this should take care of things such as emailing each other back and forth saying, can you come to this meeting? Um, and using other software applications to do that as well. You can choose whether you want them to be able to modify the event. So let's say these people that are currently I'm inviting don't normally have um, permissions to modify my events. If I want them to be able to modify this one since they're part of the meeting, I can select modify events then they would be able to add attachments and, and change the date if they needed to and whatnot. Um, whether they can invite others or see the guest list. Seeing the guest list is kind of nice because then they'll be able to tell once people start to respond. Um, there'll be a checkbox by them if they've responded that they're coming, a circle with an X if they're not. So let's say that you know, either me or one of my colleagues really had to be there, not both of us had to be there, they already said they were coming, then I can see that I do have something else planned and I don't need to come. So. You will also see this rooms link at the right hand side here. So let's say I want to reserve a conference room for this meeting. I can select rooms. It will only show me the available rooms that are currently on the list. So let's say I wanted to reserve Dempsey 301. I would select add. 
So now that room is invited, it's going to automatically appear on that calendar. So of the rooms that are showing in this list, um, just be aware there are certain rooms that do have moderators. So they are in charge of those rooms and they can either accept or decline that invitation. So some rooms are wide open. I know all of our Dempsey conference rooms, they're wide open. If it's available, it's yours. Mm -hmm. Will it get a check mark then if they approve it? It will send you an email, accepted or declined. So they will get an email when that calendar is invited, and then they will be able to say accept or decline. So they'll get notified of it. But with Dempsey, it's just... Dempsey is wide open. So you just hit add, it's added. There's no buddy that accepts or declines them. If you Perfect. book it, it's booked. We do recommend, especially, I know for the Dempsey ones, the way that we always booked them before, we like you to put um, your name and extension in there, just in case for some reason there's like an emergency and somebody needs it for something and they need to contact you or, right. So that is helpful if you can at least put your contact information. Normally we would just put it inside of the um, title here. So once you're done, you can go ahead and select Save. And when you do that, it's going to ask you if you have guests, if you want to send an invitation to those guests. So that will send an email if you say yes. Um, if you say no, it will not send an email, but it will still appear on their calendar. I think it's usually nice to send an invitation to them. Um, that's up to you. And then they can respond again whether they can come or not. I'm going to just discard this. If I need to delete an event, I can do that by clicking on it, and then I get my edit event or delete option. So edit would bring me back into that same dialog box we were just in. Um, and then delete automatically just deletes it. It does not ask you if you want to save the team, or it does not ask you, are you sure you want to do this? It just deletes it. Um, if there are guests involved, it will ask if you want to send them a notification that the event is being deleted. If there is a particular instance of, let's say, that you reserved a conference room and you no longer need it, you have a different one that you can use, but you're still having the meeting, you do want to make sure that you go in there and you take that off. So for the instance, if I had added the room of LB12. I just want to make sure I go in here and select the X next to it and then save it. So that conference room would be available for somebody else to use then. If you want to share your calendar, you can do that by going over to My Calendars at the left hand side clicking the drop-down arrow at the right, and choosing Settings. So then next to your calendar, so I'm going to go next to my Titan Apps training calendar, um, here's that notifications area that I had mentioned. So that's where you can choose um, how you want to get notified of things that you're invited to, um, new events, changed events, and so on, if you want to get an email, as well as your pop-up or any type of reminder. Um, so that you can change um, to whatever you like. But we want to talk about the Share Edit Settings. So we're going to select Share Edit Settings. And again, like I had mentioned, the Share This Calendar, the free busy availability is turned on for everybody at UW Oshkosh, and we really would like you to keep that on. Again, so when you're trying to set up meetings with people, it's much easier to do so. If you want to share with specific people and give them additional permissions, you would do that under Share with Specific People. Again, you don't have to enter the email address. You simply have to enter the name. So if I want to share with Sarah, see all event details means that she will be able to read the calendar. 
And again, only anything that's marked as default when I create that event, not anything that's marked as private. Make changes and manage sharing would mean that Sarah could read, add, modify, and delete. And she could also share with others. So normally this is not a permission that you're going to give somebody on your personal calendar. Make changes to events would mean that they could read, add, modify, and delete. So they cannot share with other people. So this may be one that, let's say, your supervisor gives you because they want you to manage their calendar or you're in charge of another calendar. And then show only free busy. We know what that does. Um, if you don't want to give that person permissions or you want to take them off the list, you would select the trash button under the remove column. And again, anytime you make changes here, make sure you select save. So to get back to my calendar, I'm going to select this back to calendar link. So we had a question earlier of why do I see all of these other people's calendars or why do I see all of these events that are not mine? That is very li likely because somebody has shared with you and their calendar view is turned on. So at the left hand side here underneath other you'll notice that I have quite a few calendars. If somebody's calendar is turned on the color in front of their name will be showing as filled in. So if I turn on Brandon's, you can see his color is blue. If I turn on um, the Dempsey 212, that is gray. So these are the events that I currently want to view, the calendars that I currently want to view. If I don't want to view those calendars, I can click on the box in front of it to turn it off. So if I clicked on Brandon's, you'll notice it turned off. When my mouse is hovered over it though, it does look like it's still on. So you really have to kind of move your mouse away and you can tell that it's off. So you can view multiple calendars at once to see if those particular people are busy. So I turned on, well these two people have the same color. That's one thing to be careful of. If you click the drop down arrow next to somebody's calendar, you get the options of changing the colors. You can see that I have Emily and Laura are both yellow. Probably not a good idea. So I'll change Laura or I'll change Emily to purple. So now I can see Laura's and Emily's. If I needed to meet with both of them, I can see what time is going to work best for both. My calendar is on by default. Underneath my calendars, you can see that that is turned on. If I want to, I can turn it off by clicking on it. So you can always turn yours off as well if you don't need to see your availability. Let's say I really only need to see Laura's availability right now. I can do that quickly by clicking on the drop down next to her name and selecting display only this calendar. And then it turns all of the other ones off. If I want to get back to mine, I can click the drop down and say display only this calendar. Now notice with my calendar, even though it's only mine, it is showing different colored events because we've changed that color for that particular event. So when we created it, we said we want this color to be it's like this pinkish color. So again, you kind of need to be careful if you assign the color to somebody else um, and you have that turned on, your events may be the same color. So like I had said earlier, if somebody shares with you and gives you specific permissions, it will send you an email to tell you that and they're automatically going to appear in your list. If there is somebody that does not want to share with you but does have their free busy availability turned on and you need to view their availability a lot, you can do that by adding 
Add Coworkers Calendar. So you simply click right in the Add Coworkers Calendar, type in the person's name, and let's say I want to add Marks here. So I add his calendar. Now as soon as I do that, as soon as I add a new calendar, it automatically just turns that calendar on. So just be aware of that, that it automatically will be turned on. I can click it to turn it off. Are there any questions on adding calendars, coworkers' calendars? Yes. Uh, did you talk about the uh, imported calendar you have up there? And, uh, and how we can import calendars from, from the uh, I can, sure. Do you mean from like your Titan calendar? Is it Sun Mall or the Oh, this one? Yes. Um, there are instructions underneath the Titan Apps site. So if I go back here and go back to Titan Apps. And it's the calendar migration tool. Okay. So you'll want to follow through these steps to do it. Basically what you do is you will export it from Titan Calendar. And then the second step is to so you take the first step of exporting it, and here are the instructions how to do that. Next step is to process that particular file that you just exported through the migration tool. And the reason you need to make sure you follow this step is, um, which is basically just uploading that file and then submitting it, is because if you do not do this, all of your events will come in as public. So you would select Browse, Browse to that file that was created up in the first step, and hit Submit. Then what happens, it will create a zip file for you that will have your tasks and your calendar events. Then you will take that and import it. So you don't want to use that very first file. You want to use that one that's created inside the zip file. So to import, that would be under Other Calendars. And you click the drop down here and select import calendar. And you choose which calendar you want to import it to. Normally it would be yours. Or you, yeah, to your main one. Um, unless you want to import it to a secondary one that you've created. But the most important step in that is make sure that you grab the correct file. The one that went through that migration tool. If you do need to create additional calendars, you can do that under My Calendars, clicking on the drop-down, and select Create New Calendar. So any new calendars you create will show again underneath your My Calendars. You add a calendar name, choose how you want to share that calendar with others, or if you want to share with specific people, and then select Create Calendar. And again, that calendar is going to show under your My Calendars. And then you can view both of them at once if you wanted to. Um, one thing we do want to let you know as far as secondary calendars go, let's say that you have um, office staff and you want to set up a vacation calendar. And you only want them to have permissions to invite to it. You wouldn't set that up as a secondary calendar underneath your account because it's very difficult to invite a secondary calendar and to find how to invite it. So what we recommend for that is, is if your department already has a general account, so like we have our general training account, and we currently don't use the calendar for anything, we could use the calendar for that. Or if you are without a general account, you can always call the help desk and have a separate account set up for that. For just basically calendar use. It'll have an email account assigned to it, but you can just use it for calendar. Um, the other thing I want to show you as well is you will notice underneath my other calendars that I have subscribed to the Dempsey conference rooms, Dempsey 212, Dempsey 301. Reason being is because I like to see if they're available before I create the actual event. Because again, it only had that checkbox that says show only available. So I can click on this to show if it's available or not. 
So in order to subscribe to those calendars, you can do that by selecting the drop down arrow next to other. Choose browse interesting calendars. In the system, they have all the different holidays. They have sports. And then underneath more, we have resources for UW Oshkosh. So if you click on that, here are all those rooms that are available. And then you would just simply select subscribe next to the one that you want to show. And I can click on back to calendar to get back to my calendar. If you decide you do not want to show one of the calendars in your list, you can again hover over that particular calendar, click on the drop down arrow and say hide this calendar from the list. And then that would go away. Are there any questions on calendar at all? Great. Okay. Then switching over and talking about drives or documents. If you want to grab that handout, you can turn to page two, because page one is the same in all the handouts. So as I had mentioned, Google Drive is the web-based file storage area where you can create and upload files. So you can access them anytime you're logged into your account. You can also share with others and again, you can share and have real-time collaboration. So I can be working on the document at the same time as somebody else, and I can see exactly the changes that they are making, and vice versa. So to access the Google Drive or documents, um, you would do that in your application bar that goes across the top here, and you would select, um, again, yours is either going to say documents or drive. So select, mine says drive. Does everybody else say drive or does it say documents right now? Okay. It should automatically change to drive, I believe. If it doesn't... Um, yes. If you've never been there, there will be a go to Google Drive button in the top right corner. Just click on that. And as usual, you'll have your search bar that goes across the top where you could search for any of your documents or files. Um, going over to the left, you have your create button. So this is where you're going to go when you want to create a new. You can create documents, presentations, spreadsheets, um, forms, or drawings. You can add folders to organize them in. The button over to the right is your upload. So you can upload different types of files. You can upload like Word documents, um, spread Excel spreadsheets, uh, PDFs. Below that is your My Drive. So this is going to be any documents that you have created, any documents or folders. Under Shared with Me is going to be anything that has been shared with you. So if somebody shared something with you, that will show automatically under Shared with Me. So going back to my drive, if I want to create something new, I'm going to select create. And let's say I just want to create a new document. Select document. By default, it's untitled. So I can go ahead and just click up here and change the title. <coughs> select OK. My changes are automatically saved, so I don't have to go to File, Save. There is no File, Save. It's just automatically saves those changes for me right away. I can start typing in the document. Um, you can use the formatting options at the top, um, the menus as well. And let's say at this point, I'm done making my changes or the document started and now I want to share it with somebody else who's going to make additional changes to it. So let's say maybe we're doing office procedures and um, April has to do her own office procedures because I don't really know exactly what she does. So she does her own, I do my own, and I can do that by selecting the share option. 
So right now it's private. Only those who I have given access to, which at this point is nobody, will be able to access it. So again, it says enter names or email of the group. Again, you can share with a group as well. So if you have a distribution list set up, you can share with that whole group and they can collaborate. So if I want to share this with April, select her name, choose what type of permissions I want to give her. Do I want her to be able to edit it or comment or just be able to view? I'll let her edit it. Then whether I want to notify her via email, so this will send an email to her. I can send a copy to myself. I can paste the item itself into the email. So I'll say share and save. So now April has edit permissions. I can see that here and I can say done. So now if April would go to on the left hand side and select shared with me. So you can just, you should have it open in a tab. And then you can click on that document to open it. And just one second. And go ahead and start typing anything in there. Just letters is fine, anything. I think I opened the wrong one. Hold on one second. There we go. So I can see April typing. I can also see that there is one other viewer, which should be April, and it is. So I can see the changes that she's making. If I wanted to, I could type as well. Oh, That's okay. <laughs> Don't overlap the other person. <laughs> now you should be able to, yeah. So I can see her changes. She, she can see mine. It's automatically saving those changes for us. I can go and look at the revision history. So if I don't like the changes that she made, I can revert back to a previous version. So I can do that by going under File and then selecting See Revision History. Now at this point, I cannot make any changes when I'm looking at the revision history window. Um, but let's say I want to go back to that this version. See, this is the version that April made changes to. Or I want to go back to that very first version. Um, but let's go back to this one. I would say restore this version. And so now that is the current <laughs> version out there. It's very, very nice to collaborate with people. Um, again, they do have to have a, thank you, <laughs> they do have to have a Google account. So a lot of questions, um, one of the big questions that I do get is that, um, is Titan Apps or Titan Files going away? And at this point, Titan Files is not going away. We still have a contract that we're fulfilling. So um, there are certain things in Titan Files that are easier to do, such as sharing with people off campus. Um, you can kind of you can sign a ticket and give them kind of a backdoor into the system. So at this point, but it, we do want to let you know that this is a tool that you can use. That's out here, which a lot of people are really using heavily. That's all that I usually go through um, as far as that goes. Um, Nick Dvorak does give a specific training session on how to work with it and different uses of it as far as the sharing collaboration goes. And his handout is on our website as well, is the Titan app site also. Yes, that's perfect. We were just going there. So if I log out of, or I sign out of this, which is basically I'm in Google Drive, it's going to log me out of all applications. So it's going to log me out of email, calendar, anything else I have open. If I click sign out, um, and I can reassure you by just refreshing the browser, and it shows that I'm signed out. Any questions on anything that we went through at all? Okay. Um, I'm going to have you, if you can just take a minute to fill out the evaluation quickly, which we do with a Qualtrics survey. 
So if you look in the taskbar at the bottom, you should have your Internet Explorer icon. Actually, it doesn't matter which browser you have open, I don't think, unless, yeah, it wasn't saved. And then, so just whichever browser you want to work in. And you want to go to www.uwosh.edu slash training. And I'll make a shortcut on these machines. That they were just re-imaged. So once you get to the training site, at the left-hand side, if you click on training classes, and then at the very bottom, um, actually second to bottom, is your class evaluation. So click on class evaluation. And then click on the training class evaluation link. I'll just make sure everybody was able to get to that. And then for your class type and class name, just choose Titan Mail. Um, scroll right here. That's okay. Yes. Titan Mail for both. And today is the 25th. Sixth. Sorry. Be behind. Yep, and just Titan Mail for the next one too. <laughs> 